When you buy cryptocurrency, you own nothing. I could not agree with this more. And we're going to read this article from Scott McKillop over at Advisor Perspectives. 100% agree. It's actually funny. So my wife and I went to uh, uh, two of my kids. They, uh, they did cross country at an end of the year banquet last night. And we're sitting in the chow line waiting to you know get served for the... Um, the food and we're talking to uh, people in front of us and one's a professor actually it's kind of interesting and a uh, lady and we got to talk about crypto and you know bitcoin uh doggy coin you know ethereum and all that and uh <laughs> it's it, just the whole thing like are we missing out and we're all kind of laughing because we're like i mean there's nothing there there's no one there there and uh the i and the idea that it's going to be you know, again as i always say the idea is going to replace a dollar as a currency of exchange is silly the idea is a store of value is silly because there is no store of value. If you there's just there's no store of value, man. Crypto is simply what someone is willing to pay for. So let's read this article. Um, look, if you want to buy it and speculate, that's fine. As I always say, just remember you're speculating. You're not investing. You're not. And the same is no different than a baseball card collection. No, if you're in, in buy, if you're owning it because you enjoy seeing the Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card or the Mike Messina just saw my uh, one of my uh, minor league rookie cards. Uh, Mike Miss or the uh, major league rookie cards, Mike Messina from the Hager Style Suns before it became, uh, I think it's in the Hall of Fame, I believe, for the Orioles. I like that stuff, it's fun. Owning crypto might be fun, but it's not an investment, it's a speculation. And you're speculating that my Mike Messina rookie card will be worth more. Eh, it's not an investment, it's a speculation. So just keep that in mind. Now, anyway, real good article here. Uh, Dateline about a month ago. Man, I've had this up here for a month. <laughs> I'm neither for nor against crypto. Now, all the crypto people are like, you're obviously against it if you're challenging crypto. It's just silly. But anyway. But when you buy uh, crypto, you own nothing. This apparently doesn't bother those who own the thousands of different cryptos available with a total market cap about $2 trillion. Somewhere between 21 million and 59, uh, 59 million Americans own more than 100 million. And more than 100 million people own crypto. And that number is growing. It is so mainstream that denizens of every corner of the financial services industry are looking for ways to profit. Exactly. Product manufacturers, platform custodians, blah, 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 are all responding to the market dynamics. Here, seems like ESG. ESG, same thing. It used to be portfolio insurance. Yeah, just uh, the whole thing. It's just crazy. Uh, crypto is being repositioned to be more palatable to financial advisors and their clients. This old image of the currency of choice on the dark web is being painted over to give it a more comfortable quality of familiarity. For example, crypto is being packaged to make it look more our old friends, mutual funds, ETFs, and separately managed accounts. This will make it almost indistinguishable from other portfolio holdings and reduces anxieties about the operational aspects. It is now regularly referred to as an asset class. Use of this terminology is designed to slip crypto into the tent of respectability and make it seem just like another tool in the financial advisor toolbox. Likewise, daily uh, providers and pundits regularly measure and discuss, discuss crypto's long-term expected return, volatility, and correlations as though it had been around for 100 years. One notable and laudable exception is the risk lies program. It labels cryptocurrency as a young asset class, thus warning advisors about the lack of reliability on crypto data. This is normal and necessary process of the financial industry embraces crypto in response to client demands. Again, man, clients demand, we're going to provide, our industry can provide. It's, it's not, the industry doesn't give it for the client. The client says, I want this industry, we're going to make it work by ETFs, by uh, option trading. You, we're going to make it work. If you want ESG, we're, well, doggone, we're going to provide you ESG. I was talking to someone who's near and dear to my heart. And <laughs> she was telling me, that uh, ESGs, the clients want ESGs, so they're going to provide ESGs. We all kind of chuckled because it's such a fallacy of ESG investment to make people feel like they're doing something for green or or governance or you know fair trade. It's, it's just a clown show. But yeah, that's what the clients want. If you're not going to provide it, somebody else will. Same thing with crypto. All right. When you buy shares of Apple, you own a percentage of the company. There is a market comprised of buyers and sellers that determine the value of that stock. But independent of that market, you own something that is tangible with intrinsic value. You own a share of Apple's assets and its income stream. If you buy a bond issued by Microsoft, you have purchased a promise by Microsoft to pay you certain amounts of money and various dates in the future. 
That promise is secured by the assets of Microsoft. Again, buyers and sellers determine what those bonds are worth on any given day, but the promise exists independent of the buyers and sellers. And if Microsoft fails to live up, you can go after Microsoft's assets to secure the payment. The same is the same with other traditional asset classes, uh, your home, but with slight variations that reflect the nature of the asset owned. If you invest in real estate, you own the land or building. If you invest in gold, you own the actual commodity. Uh, you can use it for jewelry or even industrial purposes, copper. If you invest in commodities, you own a barrel of oil, a basket of soybeans, or a cow that is utility independent of its market value. Yes, the buyers and sellers that comprise the market set the price, but those assets are tangible useful and valuable in their own right. That is not true of crypto. Bitcoin, for an example, is a dominant cryptocurrency, ranging from 40% to 70% of the total crypto market. It was created in 2009 by a person or a group of people by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. The number of Bitcoin tokens was capped at 20 million. About 19 million of those tokens are in circulation today. When you buy Bitcoin, your tokens are held in a wallet and you are given a key to access the account. The language evokes a mental picture that is at odds with the fact that Bitcoin transaction does not involve any real life coins, tokens, wallets, or keys. Quite literally, when you buy Bitcoin, you get nothing. There's only an electronic record of your transaction maintained in cyberspace via blockchain. Your Bitcoin has value only if others are willing to buy it from you. I cannot stress this enough. It's the greater fool theory. It's no different than that, man. It has value only to the extent someone else is willing to pay for it more than when I bought it, if that makes sense. If people are not willing to pay for it, there's no value. It's just that simple. Unlike every asset class, Bitcoin has no independent intrinsic value. And unlike a true currency, Bitcoin is not backed by the full faith and credit of anything. A true currency, unlike a true currency, is not backed by anything. But cash is a fiat. Yeah. <laughs> cash is a freaking pretty doggone strong fiat, though, because I use that to buy stuff every single day, as you do too. Mr. Nakamoto will not make you whole if the market for Bitcoin dries up. Bitcoin's value is purely a product of the market for it. I, this is Bitcoin's value is purely a product of the market for it. Crypto proponents often point to the remarkable nature of the blockchain uh, technology in support of the value of digital assets. It is remarkable indeed, but you do not gain an ownership in that technology when you buy Bitcoin any more than you gain an ownership interest in the internet when you buy a product through Amazon. So by using the blockchain to buy a Bitcoin, I do not own any of the blockchain. Similar to by buying a product on the internet, I do not own anything of Amazon. I don't own anything of the internet if I buy a product via Amazon, via the internet. The market for Bitcoin exists on a decentralized blockchain in cyberspace, it does not have a physical location, is not controlled by a person or a group of executives. It operates solely in accordance with the protocols and processes built into the original architecture. All right. To access the buyers and sellers who assign value to your Bitcoin, your transaction must pass through a worldwide network of independent miners who use a blockchain to perform tasks essential to the maintenance and development of the blockchain ledger. Anyone can mine Bitcoin if they have sufficient computing power to compete with other miners. It is unregulated. It was set up that way intentionally to protect it from the political pressure and government interference. Power is meant to be distributed among the stakeholders in the Bitcoin community. It is fundamentally different from the way other exchanges provide access to buyers and sellers. The New York Stock Exchange is located at 11 Wall Street in New York. Its president is Stacey Cunningham. Trading is conducted by licensed brokers and dealers primarily through computer systems owned and maintained by the exchange. The NYSE is regulated by the SEC. Whether one system is better or not is completely in the eye of the beholder. But there are two different ways of accessing the buyers and sellers who comprise and determine the value of the assets being bought and sold. Bitcoin was introduced 12 years ago. The first commercial transaction using Bitcoin took place in 2010 when Bitcoin enthusiast Laszlo Hainex purchased two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. Two pieces for 10,000 Bitcoin. At today's prices, those pies are worth over $400 million. <laughs> Ether, the crypto with the second highest market cap, did not appear until 2007. This whole thing is so freaking silly, man. 
did appear in 2015. In their early years of adoption, both Bitcoin and Ether grew slowly compared to the last couple of years. After a spike from 2017 to 18, the crypto market broke loose in 2020 as adoption skyrocketed and financial institutions became interested. Thus, crypto is relatively new and its performance history is brief and streaky. Determining meaningful long-term expected returns, vol volatilities, and correlations is simply not possible. There's not enough data. Based on its history, there's no reason to believe that the past performance will look anything like that going forward. Crypto has moved from beyond its infancy when it's viewed primarily as a payment mechanism for criminals, drug dealers, and cyber geeks. It's grabbed the attention of sovereign governments, which are taking different approaches to it. China is very inhospitable to it. El Salvador has adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. It looks like what uh, was it Venezuela or Zimbabwe? Think about the same. The SEC are, and global regulators are deciding how to set the rules around this new phenomenon. All the while, crypto gains in popularity and acceptability among individuals. And this inf uh, information, measuring and quantifying its history, will tell you a little about, about its future. Yet to incorporate cryptocurrency into portfolios using the traditional approach, you need to develop reasonably reliable expectations about future returns. And these are all guesses, 100%. It stands an asset class by itself, unlike traditional assets. It shouldn't be grouped together with them. It can't be analyzed that way. Its essence is supply and demand. In the absence of demand for it, it is worthless and does not exist. Is nothing absence the, the nothing in the absence of a willing purchaser. Having said that, the number of willing purchaser is large and get larger. You know what I'm saying? As I write this, Bitcoin's recent price has ranged from forty and fifty thousand. Uh, I think to right now, let's take a look. Uh, Thomson Reuters uh, thinks Bitcoin will hit one fifty by twenty twenty five. <laughs> Just based on what supply and demand. Uh, what is Bitcoin doing today? I don't know. And this is written, this is published October 6th. So today is trading at, uh, let's see here, 60,000. Uh, ARK Invest Kathy Wood thinks Bitcoin will surge to 500,000. <laughs> On the other hand, Vanguard's chief economist says there is no enduring economic or investment rationale to expect cryptocurrencies to generate positive returns. Jamie Dimon calls it a fraud, worse than tulip bulbs. We don't know. Only time will tell who's right. Uh, my, many sources recommend a 1% to 2% allocation. Few recommend more than 3 to 5%, but there's no science between any of these recommendations. All right. Then make sure they understand the name. Okay, uh, let's see what kind of uh, comments, because they're always good. Oh, man, there's no comments on this thing. Yeah, where's the comments? Hold on a second. What they do for the comments? Hold on a second. All right, so my man, Will Bill Bangin, you know Bill Bangin, he says... How much different Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are from fiat currencies such as the U.S. dollar? He makes a good point because there's really nothing substantive backing the U.S. dollar anymore. As at least in the pre-Nixon days, there was gold. At least with Bitcoin, you have a guarantee that it will not be printed oblivion. Well, the answer that there's nothing back in the U.S. dollar is there is something back in the U.S. dollar, which is every single person has it. Every single person transacts in it, 100%. And every single person knows that the dollar right now can buy something. Now, if everyone on their minds just said, I'm not using the dollar anymore, the dollar would lose value, 100%. However, you did not buy two pizzas 10 years ago for the equivalent of 400 million bucks. It's just, I'm, just, I'm surprised Bill doesn't see that. So if I'm going to buy a car today, how much am I going to pay for it? A Bitcoin? One Bitcoin for the Tesla? Two? Two Bitcoins? When before I could buy, literally, think about it. One Bitcoin would buy a Tesla today. Ten years ago, the guy bought the equivalent of two pizzas for four hundred million dollars. And what do you say, eleven thousand Bitcoin, whatever it was? Crazy. Uh, it's a fascinating phenomenon. This is Scott, who, who authored this, it seems there are trade-offs. Bitcoin theoretically has limited supply, unlike fiat currencies, which underlies the value retention that Bitcoin advocates. Now, on the other hand, if sovereign governments decide to muscle the early cryptocurrencies out of place, like China's doing, who will show up to resist? Exactly. If sovereign governments print too much money or blow up their economies in the process, at least there's someone or a group who can theoretically show up to set things right. It might be a new regime, but at least someone will be there to try to put them out the fire. Uh, whether you trust or not is different. I can completely, um, let's see. Is nothing in the absence of a willing purchase is, is true of everything that's being bought, including fiat currency and people? Yeah, but that's not true because we know for a fact that Microsoft will literally pay you back regardless of a willing purchaser. 
If Microsoft's go bankrupt, it won't pay it back. But we know it's based on cash that Microsoft has. It's based on the earnings. The dividend you get from Apple, the dividend you get from utility is based on the earnings those companies have. It doesn't have to have a willing purchaser to buy it back from you. It just has to have value. Same thing with the value of your land. You can still grow stuff on your land. You can't with Bitcoin. You can't with a dollar, I grant you. But again, the dollar is in a separate world by itself because everyone's saying, oh my goodness, everyone's going to lose value in the dollar. It's just not. The dollar is still the number one traded currency in the world and will continue to be for many years. Now, it might be losing value relative to inflation. You want to know inflation is Bitcoin. Well, let's be perfectly honest with you. $400 million in two, in two pieces. That's inflation. All right, hold on a second. Wait. Uh, you misunderstood my article, Michelle. So Michelle says, cryptocurrency offers current owner scarcity, proof of ownership, and exclusion of outside influence on your wealth in a world saturated with money flowing from central banks. Uh, the law firm my husband works with has a crypto division. At some point, when something has been around for 10 years, it's worth considering, is it really a flash in the pan? Eh, I don't think so. Uh, let's see. Gold has separate and in, in value apart from its market price, 100%. It can be used for industrial purpose to make jewelry, same with soybeans, same with land, same with your house. I mean, you can argue against a dollar, but okay, that's silly to say the dollar is not worth it. Now send it to me. I'll be happy to take it off your hands. Uh, okay, great piece. I gave a lunch talk on digital currencies. That's a pretty good summary of it. All right. Uh, one quibble, the reversibility of credit card transactions is a function of the nature of credit cards, not the underlying currency. All right. Um, all right. So anyway, that's pretty good stuff here. What backs currency is the full faith and credit of the issuing government. What backs crypto is enthusiasm and some lesser use of black markets. This is what I was saying. I mean, the, the, we still have the full faith and credit of the U.S. government backing the dollar. That's just a fact. Now, you might not like that. You might say they're inflating it to death or deflating if you want to look at in terms of the value of the dollar going down because of inflation. But it's the idea that uh, just it's just not the same thing. Now, I see increasingly corrupt and growing criminal enterprises, a major driver scam over the Internet has become an economic infestation of tremendous proportions. Based on my experience over the past few years, so has been the expanding number of underworld users, the vast supply of speculators. I do not see an end in sight. If and when it comes up, it'll be speculating in its demise, a financial nuclear explosion. There's now one to two trillion of this worthless vapor floating around, and certainly to be more. When and where it does a hyperbolic growth end, 10, 50, 100 trillion, is Bitcoin the new fiat for precious items like diamonds and rare metals? Even those reach points were, even those reach points where prices collapse. Yeah, I, uh, I actually agree with Richard 100%. 100%. Um, that's good stuff, man. So let's see if anyone, uh, uh, let's see here. We don't have to take a position either way. Um, all right. There'll always be 10. Okay. Anyway, so good stuff, man. Um, all right. Anyway, I appreciate it guys. So, uh, I'd love your thoughts. Let's see. Let's see what you got. Let's see guys.